I'm very glad to be here. It's invaluable to me in the numerous author's queries I get who want to find a publisher. And we only have, except manuscripts, through agents. So we refer the writers to AuthorLink because I think that is the place that they will find what they need. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, Nan, you are the Senior Vice President of Doubleday and you are the editorial director and publisher for Nan A. Talese Books. Right. Yes. And when you began Nan A. Talese Books in the 1990s, in 1990 I believe, yes. what was your vision then for the line, for the imprint? Well, it really came out of the fact that I had been publishing from the time I was at Simon & Schuster to Houghton Mifflin and then to Doubleday for many, many years, and right from the beginning of their careers, authors like Margaret Atwood, Ian McEwan, Barry Unsworth, then Pat Conroy at Houghton. And when I came to Doubleday, uh, and I only left Houghton because going back and forth on the shuttle to Boston became, um, well, it ended up in the fact that I wasn't doing anything very useful but being in transit most of the time. Um, it was such a big publishing house, and I thought how, and also was sort of best-selling and very popular, its reputation was for best-selling, very popular writers. And I thought, now how are my authors, who are literary authors, going to be recognized in, when there's so many books to be sold, and it's really just a small part of the Doubleday list. And uh, so it was suggested that I have my own imprint. And that was something I was really never in favor of. I thought it was rather a vanity for editors. But in this instance, I thought no, because it would not only be good for the authors, like when Margaret Atwood had already broken through into product recognition, but Ian McEwan really hadn't, Barry Unsworth hadn't. I mean, many of them were on the cusp, and I just thought they would get lost. And I knew that the booksellers would um, be tremendously supportive. This was at a time when we had many more independent booksellers of my list. And also it would be very good for new writers who came in because under the imprint they'd be associated with already successful literary writers. And that was oh, essentially the logic behind it. I see. Now, how has that vision changed over time? Do you think it's changed at all? Um, I'm not sh No, I don't think it has. I mean, the, the atmosphere around it certainly has. But what I intended to do and what I do um, is the same. We published, when I came to Doubleday, I brought 40 authors with me. So oh. it was already a cohesive group. It's still very much the same thing. I was one of the first people who had um, a uh, website because I realized I didn't have very much marketing money for the authors, and so I had a website build and did a newsletter, and this must have been in, I don't know, 93, 94. Oh, you were a pioneer. Well, I was just <laughs> desperate for my authors to get attention. It was simply that. And um, so I really... Uh, it's still the same way. I still introduce new writers. I still, uh, we have them reviews and everything and announcement and on my website and on the newsletter. And uh, I send galleys uh, to booksellers and to um, uh, book reviewers, of which there are fewer and fewer these days. Yes, that's true. And, but I think, particularly if it's a new writer, because they know that sort of Conroy and Thomas Cahill and um, Valerie Martin and Atwood and McEwen, they expect a certain excellence in yes. an unknown writer. And I think in that way it works. Eventually the writer has to make his own way in building his audience, but I think it gives them a chance at a debut that is somewhat noticed. What are the characteristics that make for a good novel? Uh, 
Well, I think the, the characteristics that all the writers share, fiction and nonfiction, is they're storytellers. They use the language beautifully, and they have a passion about what they're writing. And that very, in the first opening pages, um, is conveyed to the reader, and the reader is carried along. And I think that's true with Tom Cahill or Alex Kotlowitz when he wrote There Are No Children Here. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's what you as a reader want. You want to open a book and to come into a world and you want the writer to do the work for you and sweep you through. You don't want to have to trudge uphill to discover what this is about. So you don't dumb down your books? Quite the opposite. I mean, yeah. there I, I find many, many books that have become successful that I have decided not to publish because I didn't think they had enough weight. I mean, I think, I think a book has to be about something important. So you think that the role of books today should be what? I mean, there should be a message or? No, yeah. not a message. I think, uh, I think uh, Ormond Pamuk said this very recently. Why books? are more important in bringing readers into another land or another culture or um, a world that they had not known, that the novel gets them more deeply under, ingrained in the culture and helps one to understand more than a film, no matter how exciting. It's only two or two and a half hours of watching something that is being presented sort of at you. The thing about books is that the reader is an equal participant. The writer puts the words down, but the reader creates the pictures in his mind. Yes. And I know when I started publishing Yasmina Kadra, who is an Algerian writer, and his first book I did was The Swallows of Kabul, and it was around the time of uh, the war in Afghanistan. Um, it brought to light what the story of these two couples living under the prohibitions of the Taliban, what it does to human life and relationships. And then uh, Kadra went on to do uh, the attack, which takes place in Israel and Tel Aviv, but it's narrated by an Arab doctor. And so you get the whole, it's, it's about a suicide bomber that happens to be the doctor's wife, and he's totally shocked because he has shared her life, adored her, and cannot understand how she could have done this. And then the last book, the ones we've just published, The Sirens of Baghdad, takes you to Baghdad um, at the time, a student is sent home from university to a small village. A boy hurts himself, and he's a boy who's mentally uh, disturbed. The Americans, on the way to the hospital, stop them. The boy goes crazy, starts running out of the car, and is shot. Mm. Now, the Americans are not, the Americans are just afraid as the boy, but the effect of what this does to those villagers. Yes on the invasion. And so, as Pamuk said, fiction can take you closer inside a situation that you do not know. Mm, very good. Well, now, does that mean that for your imprint you're looking for localities that are foreign, or...? No, not necessarily, although I do think we've been doing a lot more translation from um, different countries, because I think now we're in a global world. Americans are much more open. And also, Europeans and Scandinavians certainly have become greater storytellers than they used to be. That used to be what we were as Americans. We were terrific storytellers. But the English and the French and the Germans and Scandinavians are doing this. <laughs> yeah, are, are, and presenting different worlds, but have a universal understanding. Um, but in terms, if you asked earlier about uh, what one would look for in fiction. I think fiction today can no longer be, or at least as what I'm interested in, just relationship stories. Um, 
they have to have to sort of reach the public's interest, be on a subject that the public is interested in at the time. Mm -hmm. And happily, writers generally, their antenna is out ahead of us. So they often know more about what people are interested in than, than we are aware of. I mean, this novel, Trespass, by uh, Valerie Martin. Wonderful book. <laughs> And, you know, but it's a, it's a story of um, a liberal family when they are being tested by someone trespassing not only on their property, but into their home, this foreigner that their son falls in love with. And it's, it's you know, it's something that will, will live many years and decades because that sense of our own property and are barriers where people cannot cross. It's just a universal feeling. We have a world stage then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of this digital uh, technology that surrounds us, um, we don't have time to read and this, that, and the other. We're all running around. How does all of this technology today affect literature? Or do you think it will affect it? Or has it already affected it? Well, I think it certainly affects the marketplace. Right. Um, and as you said, running around, uh, people you know, are on iPods. They're listening to many different channels. I mean, I don't think, I mean, newspapers are really going right down the drain. Right. And happily, you know, there are websites where you can learn um, about what's going on, but you have to know which ones are the ones that you trust. So we're very much in a, a place of change where sort of the tectonic plates are shifting. And um, I mean, my hope is that eventually people are going to get tired of just listening to scattered voices constantly. Uh, and I think, but I think writers will continue to write books that that really changed the world in the way that um, the Silent Spring did and Let Us All Praise Famous Men. And I think the way we look at politics are being the Looming Tower. I mean, there are brilliant books that are being written that are expanding our understanding of others, but also um, changing the way we look at, look at Al Gore in his first book about right. the environment. It's a tremendous effect on people. So, I mean, books do change the world, but right now we're in a terribly noisy period. Uh, obviously, in this, the end of 2007, just constantly distracted both by the war and by the elections, mm -hmm. which seem to have be growing a great long white beard. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get to November 08. And, um, and so, you know, people just have to hold on to what they believe in, to be open to the world, but just believe. I think books are going to go through, um, we're in such a celebrity culture right now that I sometimes think I should ask my authors to please um, do their tour across the United States with no clothes on because then people will pay attention to their book. But short of that... <laughs> Good marketing idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in speaking of these writers, it's so difficult for them to get published and there are so many trying. What can you say to them? What, what advice can you give them? Um, writers trying to break into publishing today? Well, it depends upon why they're writing. I mean, if they really have something. I mean, as I think someone once said about acting, well, you know, your child wants to be an actor. Well, if there's nothing else they can do, it's okay. But I think you can't expect to make much of a living from writing. And I'm sure some people write simply because they enjoy it. Others write because they have something to say that they think is very, very important. And those are the writers that often find writers quite pain writing quite painful. Um, 
But I think everyone should keep their day job as they used to do at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, you didn't, only once you had enough of an audience to sustain yourself financially, you can't expect uh, writing to, to bring you a decent income. Right. You know, and people like Dick Francis and a lot of the people on the bestseller list um, have been paperback writers. They've done paperback originals to, to gather their market before they went into hardcover. Yes, yes. Well, then, what would you like readers of Nan A. Talese books to come away with? Is there some overarching theme yourself? Or? No, I think I think that I what I think readers, uh, people who are really interested in books that, and wonderful writing and want to be taken to another world through an author's voice, should feel that if they pick up a book that we publish, that that it is going to be that way. I mean, all these years I published Thomas Keneally and Schindler's List was the book I began with. And that still is a book that is really important. And it doesn't mean that they have to like it at the start or be interested, because you can't be interested in anything. And I when sometimes when people say to me, oh, you said that book was so good, but I tried it. And I'd say, it's okay, you don't have to, you know. People have moods that they're interested in reading, you know, certain things. I mean, I know sometimes I've read, started books that were, you know, very much praised, and I think, what was that all about? And then I go back to it five years later, and I understand it is something that really captures yes. me. Yes. We expect big hits right away universally, and that's not the way the world of words is. Uh, very good, Nan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Des, thank you for coming to visit.